Up. I'm just going to dismiss and let you all watch the little one. I'm going home. I know what's important and what isn't. <laughs> She's probably collecting pencils as she goes. She's collecting pencils as she goes? Yeah. Well, that's her right. Her grandpa's walking around with bananas. So it's everything, everything. Okay. Well, hello. Hello. Julia, don't leave without me. I need to get this thing straight. Like I said before, I mean, I see you now, but I need to see you in a more personal way. Like eternity. It's been a long time. I think it's been like a week. I can't even remember what day it is. Hey, good evening. Good evening. So much fun being on time for something. Isn't that just fun? You know? I've always lived to try to always be on time, and, and it's a little bit of a challenge on Sundays to mind that clock up there. Y'all don't get to see it, but I know exactly what I have to do and when I have to do it. The fun part of it is it says that I'm going to start the service tonight at 9.30 and end it at 10.45. So I hope you're in for a long one. I don't know what we're going to do that long, but it's going to happen, so it'll be a good night. How many of you had a good day today? Now, how many of you were where it rained today? Mm -hmm. Were you where it rained significantly? Yeah, had a pretty good day. So we didn't get a whole lot of rain at our house, but uh, we were out at Andrews this afternoon, and man, it flat just was a gully washer out there, which was kind of nice out in Schilling area. So that was nice. It didn't rain enough, though, out there for the ground to get mushy, because I walked to the car across the yard, and it didn't even mush. So that's how dry it's been. But uh, I have to praise the Lord for something tonight. We have had something happen this weekend that I think is the first time in the history of our family. And that is Andrew went and caught a mess of fish with his roommate and had us all out for a fish fry last night. And then because he can't be here tomorrow night for his mother's birthday party, he had us out and cooked her birthday lunch today, two meals in a row. And I looked at him at lunch, and I said, what are we having tomorrow night? And he said, you're on your own, buckwheat. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just so much fun. I mean, that's the first time we have done that, I think, ever in our family, where he fixed meals, and it was just fun to go and sit and enjoy a great lunch and a great supper last night. And um, he's found a new little fishing hole that he alone gets to fish. He said he can take me, maybe. But um, he's been catching big bass, and so that's always fun. He caught a five-pounder yesterday morning, and I helped eat it last night, so that was good. But uh, thank the Lord for fun times with family. Who has a praise tonight? Something you want to celebrate God's doing in your life. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Wonderful. Good, good, good. 
That's been a prayer answered. That is good. That is good. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. Nice. Now that was kind of fun. That is awesome. <laughs> Maybe just a little, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of comical. I thought I'd be in Super Dog House after all the stupid comments I made this morning. And all I wound up getting when I left church was offers to come and stay at their house. So I thought I was in pretty good shape. <laughs> so, well, that's awesome. I, I love the stories of couples who go back to special places. I just think that's the coolest thing in the world. I, um, we can't go back where we honeymooned in, in Vail, Colorado. We can't go back to where we honeymooned because it's no longer owned by the family that owned it and we don't have access to it. But we were in a, we were in a condo built on stilts over the Eagle River. And um, it was the coolest thing in the world. We'd, we'd leave the, the veranda doors open at night, and, and you'd go to sleep to the sound of running water, and you'd wake up to the sound of running water. I wouldn't try that now, but it was okay back then, you know. But, uh, it, yeah, it was fun. It was a neat place. Six-bedroom condo, and all they had in all the bedrooms were twin beds. What a way to start your honeymoon. <laughs> Oh, man. Who else has a praise? And you suddenly got quiet. Yes, ma'am. Amen, honey. That is awesome. That is awesome. Healing happens when we're able to talk about the tough things. That's a biggie. Man, that's huge. Oh, well, we serve a great big God who is awesome. And how about we sing about that a little bit tonight? Number 395, Love Lifted Me. <coughs> I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give. Faithful, loving service to, to Him belongs. Love lifted me, the me. Love lifted me, the me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me, the me. Love lifted me. See, the love is will obey. Be your 
Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted be the knee, love lifted be the knee. When nothing else could help, love lifted be. Love lifted be the knee, love lifted be the knee. When Turn the page, you'll find number 396, Saved, Saved. I've found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love Life now is sweet and my joy is complete For I'm saved, saved, saved He saved me from every sin and harm Secures my soul each day I'm leaning strong on His mighty I know he'll guide me all the way. Say by his power, by his power divine. Say to life, to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete. For I'm saved, saved, saved. When Go to the Lord in prayer for a moment tonight. Carol, your son, is that this week? This Wednesday, Carol's son David is having a heart procedure done and uh, going to do a heart calf. They're, they're having some struggles trying to figure out what's going on. So that'll happen on Wednesday. We want to be praying for him. It's kind of a full week. Um, let me get my, my brain kicked in gear today. Um, Jeff Enns is having surgery this week to uh, try to repair some ligament and muscle and nerve damage in his arm uh, from an accident at work, and uh, we want to be praying for him that the Lord would be with him. Uh, John Luce had a rough week. He uh, took a step wrong the other day and tore some meniscus in his knee, and he uh, was on crutches or in a wheelchair for a few days this week, which was really something that cramped his style. And uh, he was doing better this morning. He was walking gingerly. But we want to continue praying for him that the Lord would just be with him and, and just keep him in the hollow of his hand. Um, I'm sure we all have lots of things that we could lift to the Lord tonight. Let's just go to him and place his things, our things in his hands. Father... How good it is this Sunday night to be able to come into your presence and to know, God, that you're here. Your word says where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. And so tonight ours is not trying to figure out where in the world you are and how we're ever going to get your attention. But rather, God, it's ours just to say thank you, Lord, that you're here, that you've come to meet with us and that you're present in us. And 
Tonight as we come, we're just thankful, God, for the realities of what we've sung about, the, the fact that tonight we can testify through the blood of Jesus that we are saved, that having confessed our sins and believed on Jesus for our salvation, your word says that we can know that we're forgiven and we are a child of the King. Thank you, God, for your amazing love. Father, we also recognize tonight that, that when we gather in your name, you want to work among us. In fact, you tell us that those things that we agree upon on earth will be agreed upon in heaven. And so tonight, we just want to place a couple of things in your care. We want to th ask, Lord, tonight that, that you'd be with Carol's son, David, tonight. God, he's been having a tough time with, with some heart issues and uh, things happening where he passes out and they're not real sure what all's going on, but on Wednesday they'll do a heart cath early in the morning. And we just pray, God, that as they do that, they will be able to use, be used as instruments of your healing hand. That, Lord, whatever's causing the problems, whatever needs to be taken care of could just be done right then and there, or even better, that when they go to do it, they can say there's nothing wrong and there never really was. And, God, we're just going to praise you for what you do in taking care of him. Be with his family as well. I know it's tough for them, and, and I just pray, God, that you would be especially near. Father, pray also today for Jeff Enns as he goes in for surgery this week and ask God that you would be with him and just bring a, a, a healing touch upon his life. Pray you'd continue to be with Pastor John and watch over him and that, God, you'd be with all of us tonight. You know the things that we've brought with us this Sunday evening that keep us awake at night. Uh, those prayer requests, God, that we just lay before you and are burdened by. And, and Lord, tonight we just pray that you would work in every circumstance and in every situation as only you can. And God, in advance of what you're going to do as we lay those things before you, we're just going to say thank you and give you praise. Father, tonight I'm thankful for your love and for the way you just continue to pour it out upon us. And Lord, tonight as we continue to sing, I just pray, God, that you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, that he could tonight be set down at your right hand, Father, there to make intercession for us. Hear our prayer tonight, Father, as Jesus brings them to you. In his name I pray. Amen. Number 435, my faith has found a resting place. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul I Precious blood you shed 
for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Number 436, The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand when darkness seems to hide his face i rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on christ the solid rock i stand His covenant, His blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other crown is sinking sand. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible tonight, turn with me to uh, Second Thessalonians. I thought I was done with that series, but wound up back there for one more shot this week. And uh, we're going to take a look at a few verses towards the end of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I uh, have been having a lot of fun lately getting ready for the fall. Do you all get ready for the fall every year? For me, getting ready for the fall means getting ready to teach new classes in the school of ministry and and getting teachers lined up and getting students organized and helping people figure out that all they have to do is open a drop-down box and click on the right box and they get registered for the right classes. And I always wind up having to move everybody around because they get it all messed up and uh, this fall, one of the things that I'm going to be teaching is, is Organic Outreach International's intensive program on how to develop a heart for the lost and how to uh, not only make your life but make the ministries that you are a part of something that with intention reaches out to share the good news of the gospel with lost and broken people. The further I go, I don't know why this is ringing. Can you hear that? 
Children should know that I'm in church, shouldn't they? Could embarrass her, couldn't I? Let's embarrass her. Hello, Landon. We're in church. We'll talk to you later. Bye. (laughs) And his mother's thoroughly embarrassed. (laughs) Love it. I, uh, in the midst of all that, have been really praying through some of the stuff that I've been preaching. One of the things that happens uh, when you when you preach is that before it ever comes to you all, it has to filter through me. That's not mine. Thank the Lord. <laughs> and 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 those words have to kind of cycle through my soul. And and usually I'm I'm out about usually out a year in terms of knowing what I'm going to be preaching a year from now and then I narrow it down to about a six month outline and then I narrow it down to a three month outline and then I'm usually about four weeks ahead with every sermon and when I get to the week that I'm going to preach it I start on Monday morning, which is usually the worst day of my week. More pastors resign on Monday than any other day of the year, and uh, it's just the way it is, but but Monday is my worst day. I I don't do anything that requires um, decision-making, except have board meetings, and I have a whole bunch of people that make decisions for me, which is great. Um... I don't do anything that requires intentional brain work. Monday's just a day I sit down with my Bible and I sit down with an outline and I begin letting scripture and letting the word bathe me for Sunday. Uh, Last week we talked about the love of God and, and I have just been working through for the last few weeks that little mantra of love God, love others. And have been asking myself the question over and over and over again, how do you do that? What are some of the ways in your life, some of the ways in my life that I I seek to love God deeper and love others more? What, What are the things that I do intentionally to make certain that God is always first? in the love and the affection of my soul and that that as I look at people around me, I do everything that's humanly possible for me to love them the way Jesus loved them. Now, sometimes that's really, really easy. I'd like to say it's always easy to love God. I am finding the older that I get that sometimes loving God's a little tough because when I want to like relax a little, he says, oh no, you're not done. You know, just keep going, keep going. I, uh, I had a friend of mine talk to me the other day and he said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of moving towards retirement. And I said, so am I, some year. And, and he looked at me and he goes, have you set a date? Have you thought about when you finally get to, to just quit pastoring? And I said, I can't figure that one out said, first of all, the government tells me I can't retire till I'm 70, so I got 11 years to go. Second of all, when I look at my 503B and I look at my my retirement and and I look at my social security, I can't quite equate how at age 70 it's gonna work, so I just decide that retirement's gonna be something, you know, I'm just not gonna worry about. And he looked at me and he goes, I really just want to be done. And I looked at him and I said, what's God said about that? And he goes, that's the problem. And I said, for me too. Because you know, he doesn't give us a timetable. You ever thought about that? Nowhere in scripture does it say that it's such and such an age, it's such and such a time, you're gonna be able to just lay your mantle down and you're just gonna get to come and sit and enjoy everything and never have to do anything else. You're just gonna have to keep 
serving. Now I know what he says. What is it, three score and ten? And they tell us that we're getting older now before we die in the United States. That's kind of cool. They're now saying that we're going to live to 76. Praise God, some in this room are past that. And uh, I'm just saying you're doing really well. You know, you don't look nearly as dead as they say you're supposed to look. So <laughs> life is good. But, but, but here's this thing. How do I love God deeper? And then with that, and this is where I want to focus for just a few moments. How do I love others more faithfully? I would love to be able to say tonight, and I'm sure so would you, that it is just easy to love everybody. Have you figured out that it's not? I uh, had a conversation with a really good friend of mine from California this week, and her and I were talking about the state of affairs in the world and uh, the, 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 the state of Oregon had just signed into some state of quasi-law that they were no longer going to require junior and senior high school students to be responsible to know reading, writing, or arithmetic. Because reading, writing, and arithmetic are subjects that are prone towards racism. And so it's not important that we know those things. Okay. I just don't get it. And my friend Robin said to me, she goes, you know, John, she goes, you know, I live here in California and I live in one of the most liberal parts of the state and she goes, our, our, our legislators from this part of the state and, and everybody in our, in, our, in our state house, they're just a bunch of nuts. And I said, most of the nation feels that. And she goes, they just don't get it. And she goes, today we were having staff prayer and, and, and pastor brought up the idea that we were supposed to pray for those in authority over us and we all just stopped the prayer meeting and somebody said no we are not going to do that why should we pray for idiots who are making life worse for us and she said we all felt that and pastor looked at us and he said and what do you think God thinks she goes after a few moments of repentance we went to prayer <laughs> And she said, you know, John, I'm finding it harder and harder in the world that I live in to love others. And it really is tough. It's not tough because they're hard to love. It's tough because we don't like oftentimes the things they're doing, the things they believe, the things they practice. And so we just find it easier to perhaps set in judgment. And if we pray for them, we pray that God will grab them by the scruff of the neck and straighten them out. But that's not what scripture says. And tonight in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, I, I want to read to you three verses of scripture towards the end of the chapter where Paul is saying goodbye, but before he says goodbye, he has one of those moments where he's saying, oh, and by the way, let me, excuse me, remind you of just a few things. Verse 13, as for you, brothers, do not grow weary of doing good. And if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that individual and don't associate with them so that they may be put to shame. Yet, get a hold of this, do not regard them as an enemy, but instead admonish them as a brother. And what Paul's trying to say here, I think, is this. Love God. Love others. Stay at the task. 
Keep your hand to the wheel. Recognize there are going to be difficult people. Love them anyway. And point them towards life. There's four simple thoughts I want to pull out of this tonight. The first one is this. Never get tired of doing what is right in God's eyes. You ever thought about that? Do not grow weary of doing good. My first church, I had two retired elders, pastors. One had pastored 67 years in the church of the Nazarene. His largest church was a church of about 70 people during that time. He never made much money, but he had been faithful as faithful could be. The other was a man who had pastored for about 55 years. He uh, had pastored some of our great churches across the southern United States. He was what they described Peter and John as in, in Acts, an unlearned and an uneducated man. He had an eighth grade education. He was saved out of the tutelage of his uncles who were moonshiners in uh, the Virginias and in Carolina. And Brother Whitaker, he, he was just one of those guys who had more ideas and had more gospel chutzpah than anybody I've ever known. He could dream up more things to do to reach lost people for Jesus than I ever dreamed imagined. But he'd do it. And, and I remember him saying to me early in my ministry there, you gotta be careful that you never get tired of doing what God's called you to do. And I looked at him and I said with my youthful enthusiasm, I don't think I could ever reach that place. And he looked at me and he said, oh yes, you can. And you will. When you get to the place where you start doing it in your own strength and trying to force things to happen that God never intended to take place. I think it's important for us to understand that God has called us each and every one to very unique places of ministry. Joe and I were talking before service tonight and here a month or two ago, he asked if we had any Bibles here at the church. He wanted to be a missionary to his little community. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, he went door to door and handed out Bibles to all of his neighbors. Um, and, and, and he said tonight that he wondered if it did any good. And I told him, we can't measure that. Because while we can't see anything right now, who knows what the effect's going to be as time goes on. We plant seeds every day, but we don't always see them come to fruition. Paul's trying to say to believers in a vibrant church, don't get tired of doing what I've called you to do. When things aren't going the way that you want them to go, have faith and just keep your hand to the wheel. When lives aren't changing the way you'd like them to change, don't give up. Have faith. Keep sharing Jesus. When you aren't seeing souls get saved or lives transformed through sanctification, when you're not seeing people called to ministry or stepping into to places of service, never give in or give up because God's doing more behind the scenes than you'll ever see on the front side of the scene. Never grow weary 
of doing good. I'm glad tonight that God, grace gifts us with what it takes to do the jobs that we do. And I got to pick on Stan Standridge tonight. I never ask permission when I do this, and I hope I don't have to start paying y'all when I do this to you like I do my kids. But you know, here a number of years ago, my son was uh, homeschooled. We were coming to the end of his homeschool years, and Stan was getting ready to retire for I don't know how many times it was. He'd, he'd retired a few times, and they kept talking him back at, at Smoky Valley, and he developed, uh, helped to develop uh, uh, an online school there. And he worked through all the process of getting everything secured and, and, and everything credentialed and, and all that stuff. And my son got to be a part of that. And brother, if you did it for nobody else, you did it for him. He was kind of at the end of his rope with mom and dad's tutelage. He'd had all of the Latin and the stuff we were trying to ram down his throat. <laughs> and he was ready for a classroom. And the work that this man did, rather than getting tired and just quitting, made it possible for him to continue growing and becoming the man he's become. We never really know the difference we're going to make if we just hold on. Never get tired of doing what's right in God's eyes. Now, there's a second truth in here that I think is really, really important to me. Paul writes in the first part of verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with them. I think there's something really critical there for us to see. He's saying to us, choose to step away from participating with those who willfully walk in disobedience. Love them. Bear with them. Care for them but don't participate in their choices alongside of them. You and I will do more to influence people for the gospel by walking in obedience before them when they choose to disobey than we will ever accomplish by joining them in their sin thinking we can lead them out of it. It's not going to happen. I have a friend who uh, led a man to the Lord and they were in a restaurant and this man had been pretty rough and his way of saying thank, to, thank you to my friend for leading him to the Lord was to buy him a drink. And... Um, When you're a Nazarene pastor, that's not the best thing to accept. But he did. And he said, I sat there and I drank and didn't drink at all, but about halfway through I realized what had led this man to such a terrible life of sin had been alcohol. And now, without even thinking... I had participated in what was his demise. And he made this statement to me. I couldn't undo the damage I had done. It's a biggie. 
We live in a world where people are making choices every single day, and it's, it's like I said this morning when I visited recently with a pastor in the community who asked a tough question. Your church growing? Mine is. And I said, you know, mine's not. But there's a reason why. I'm not going to accommodate the world's ways of the world. I'm not going to step back and say, you can come in and sin all that you want. It's perfectly fine. God will love you anyway. And I know that's what he says. I've heard his sermons on the internet. Can't go there. And Paul's trying to say to us that if anyone doesn't obey the instructions that he's giving, take special note of them and distance yourself from them. Now, there's two reasons there, I think. Number one, you don't want to run the risk of falling into the trap they've fallen into. But number two, you can't lead from a place of want. You have to lead from a place of authority. Third truth. He makes this simple statement after having said that, that, that as we take special note of them and choose not to associate with them, we need to allow them to be put to shame. That's a hard one. Let others incur their own shame. Let them carry their own guilt. Let them deal with their own sin. I don't know why it's been the way it's been lately, but with the intention of trying to figure out how I can love God and love others more intentionally, he keeps putting people in my path who are living counterculture to what I believe scripture teaches us to embrace. And and I've had lots of opportunities to deal with folks who are, they're just not living for the Lord. And, and, and I recently had one say to me, you know, John, I know what you think about me. And I said, you do? That's so exciting. Tell me what I think because I haven't figured it out yet. If you know, it'd be great to know. And they said, well, you think I'm going to hell. And I said, well, I said, let's talk about that for a minute. This person is a practicing lesbian in a married relationship and is pretty militant about her beliefs. And, and, and she, she's just absolutely convinced that, that, that I'm all out to destroy her life. And I, I looked at her and I said, would you do me a favor? She goes, why? I said, would you come to church? What, so you can put me on display and preach at me? I said, no, so that you could meet my Jesus and see what he could do for your life. She says, well, people will judge me. I said, they won't even know. I'm not gonna tell them unless you do. And, 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 and she looked at me and she said, but, and I said, but what? I said, if you won't come, you're already telling me you feel guilty. And that's what Paul's talking about. He's saying, let people carry their own guilt, shoulder their own guilt, carry their own sense of responsibility, that if they're walking counter to the teachings of the Lord, don't make excuses or try to help them through it. Just let them shoulder that and offer them one thing, and that's Jesus only. Because when you do that, you give them the one thing they desperately need, hope, that's found in no other place except Jesus. Last thought. Verse 15. Don't regard them as an enemy, 
but admonish them as a brother or sister. Love others and hold them accountable. I think it's important for us to recognize today that the further we go, the more we are going to face in this world people who live counterculture to the church. And some of those folks we're going to sit next to every Sunday and worship, and we're not even going to realize that's where they're at, but that's where they are. They make accommodations with Scripture for things that are going on in the world, and they find ways to skirt truth and uh, compromise and just make things work so that they don't feel guilty and they give themselves permission to live as they please. And, and Paul makes it clear that, folks, we can't do that. We have to love them like our own and admonish them. It's kind of a downer. This week I had someone come to me and they said, hey, pastor, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you, you're pretty transparent. I, I, I want to ask you a question though. And I said, okay. They said, we know how you take care of us. What are you doing to take care of you? I asked them if they had something else to do with their time. <laughs> And they said the Lord sent them to tell me to rest more and give myself permission to relax. I take that admonishment as a gift from God. Because in the world we live in, there are people he puts into our pathway every day that need us to come alongside of them and say, hey, I've noticed. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm not trying to be difficult, but I'm concerned about you. And I just want to encourage you to make it positive. Now, now, now you'll notice as you read through this, Paul doesn't say anywhere, just just. Let him go on off to the devil's place. He doesn't say that. He says, love them. Let them deal with their guilt and their shame. Admonish them. Help them to become better. And never grow tired doing. Do you love parenting moments with your adult children? Do you ever love those? Where you get to see your grandchildren do things that their parents did and you get to look at them and you laugh and say, boy, that's a chip off the old block. My grandson, and I'll let you figure out which one, is very much like his mother. Gave it away. He has... Two things that are desperately Caitlinish in his life. One is, he never shuts up. It's just rapid fire. And, and, and secondly, he's always on the go. I mean, he puts the Energizer Bunny to shame. So between movement and mouth, you're like always like, where'd he go? Where'd he go? What's he saying? You're just like caught and it just drives you crazy. I looked at her the other day and I said, hey, Kate, this kid's going to go crazy someday. And it's going to be your fault. She goes, no, it won't. And I said, sure it will. Because the only thing that you model for him is <laughs> and <laughs> all the time. She looked at me and she goes, don't you have some place to be? <laughs> and we talked about it. She made a statement I'll never forget. 
She said, Daddy, I'm glad God put you in my life at this point in my journey just to hold me accountable. And I thought, never grow weary. Never get tired of doing what's right in God's eyes. Amen? So here's a challenge for you this week. Find someone who desperately needs your love. And love Jesus into them. Amen? Have fun. It's a great assignment. God bless. Have a great week. Yes, sir. I forgot to pray for him. Yes. Yeah. 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 Give me their first names again. Steve and Dixie. Dixie. Hey, let's pray. Yes, sir, to Pat. Bev Haley. Okay. All right. Hey, let's pray for these. Father, I just come to you tonight and am thankful that you are the God of immeasurably more. You're able to do more than we could ever, ever imagine, more than we could ever ask or think. And tonight there are some really big needs in front of us. God, I pray for Sharon's family tonight. We are hearing this often that in this new battle with COVID and the variants and all that's going on with that, people are getting sick in spite of vaccination or not being vaccinated. And uh, it's really hitting people hard. And yet, God, in the midst of all that, we know that you're still Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. And so I pray for this precious man and woman tonight at a hospital in Tulsa and ask God that you would be the God of immeasurably more for them and touch them tonight and drive this virus from them. God, I pray you would diminish its effect and that you would bring healing to them. I ask God you would bring a sense of comfort and assurance to the two of them as they, they pray for and think about each other, but also for their family, Stan and Sharon tonight, who live wondering what and how and what will this mean? What will this be? May your grace be sufficient to touch them and make them whole. We pray for Bev as well tonight, Lord, that you would be with her tomorrow and that God, her surgery would go well and that, Lord, your grace would be manifest in healing for her body. And Lord, I know that as we pray for these, there are a whole lot of others that right now I'm thinking about and that others in our church are thinking about. God, you know all those names. Would you help us to be responsible and faithful to do what we can to be careful, to maintain the best measure of health that we can as individuals, and that, God, we would care for ourselves and for each other in a way that 
would minimize the impact of this virus through us. And be with us, I pray, this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Find three and a half people who need a hug and do it from afar. <laughs>